Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we continue our study of the life of Paul the Apostle. This is lesson number 16. We're going to look at Paul before Felix. We're going to concentrate on Acts chapter 24. To get us started, let's get our Bibles out and take a look at chapter 24, verse 24 and 25. After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Here's an opportunity in the book of Acts for us to see the gospel in contact with the unrepentant heart. Characters such as Pilate, Gamaliel, Gallio, Festus, Agrippa, Drusilla, and Felix are placed in the gospel narrative so that we may see their reaction to the gospel. The inspiration of the scripture allows us to know these characters' real motives, know what things influence them, and what it was that made them what they were. Today, particularly, we want to look at the case of Felix. He was born a slave, but rose to prominence under Claudius Caesar. After winning many military honors, he was made the governor of Judea. Secular history points out many of his character flaws, including being lustful, cruel, ill-tempered, thinking himself above the law, and he was a poor administrator. We do know he was a man of ambition, energy, and power, but we do know also that he was susceptible to bribery, corruption, and lying. He knew his life was corrupt, and he trembled at the preaching of Paul, yet he was unwilling to repent. He kept Paul in prison even though he knew Paul was innocent, hoping to receive a bribe for his release. We know from secular history that he was married three times, first to a niece of Cleopatra, then to an unknown woman, and finally to Drusilla. Drusilla was Jewish, and she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa, and had been previously married to the king of Amasa. Felix convinced her to leave her husband and become his consort. If we're going to look at Paul before Felix, it'll be worth it for us to get our Bibles back out and read pretty much all of Acts 24. Let's begin by reading the first 21 verses, making a few comments, and then we'll conclude the chapter. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to, de but to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything with which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it was not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, 
having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, and they ought to be here before you and make an accusation should they have anything against me, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am in, on trial before you this very day. In this first public trial, Felix deferred his judgment until he could gather more information from Lysias. We hear the charges laid out by the lawyer brought by the Jews, and we've already heard now Paul bring his defense. We'll continue reading the rest of the chapter. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias, the, tr the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about the righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So Paul takes this opportunity to preach the gospel. Paul did not use rude or severe language as he preached against everything that Felix stood for, but he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. The truth found its way into the conscience of Felix, and the New King James Version says he was afraid. Now, what happens when Christianity encounters a corrupt heart and a life of guilt? That's a question we need to think about. Also, with what truths can Christianity address a man like Felix? How should these truths properly affect the mind of the hearer? And finally, how would someone of Felix's character reject these truths? With what appropriate truths can Christianity address a man like Felix? The truths chosen by Paul for the occasion were indeed appropriate for preaching to Felix. Beyond that, they are appropriate today. These are topics that God employs to arouse our minds, to convict us of our unrighteousness, to make us realize our guilt, and to lead us to feel the need for a Savior. Under the condemnation of this preaching, we see from our passage that Felix trembled, as it says in the old King James Version. First, Paul talked about righteousness. It's a subject that applies to every man, but especially to one whose job calls for him to dispense justice like Felix. This topic covers a broad range of scripture, including right and wrong, the obligations of justice, the character of a righteous God, and how a sinner may attain and maintain righteousness. All views of religion must begin here, because salvation comes through obtaining righteousness. Paul also spoke of temperance, or self-control. This would include controlling our sensual passions, our pride, our selfishness, our ambition, our anger, and revenge. 
All of these are in addition to the more commonly held subjects of temperance, such as eating and drinking. The proper restraint and government of our passions is also a scriptural topic for preaching and teaching the gospel. The third thing that Paul talked to Felix about was judgment to come. The day of final reckoning when God will call all men to give account for their life. There will be a judgment. The judgment will render certain results. It will be solemn. And the divinity and qualifications of the judge will be made known. All are fit subjects to be preached. What then does Christianity teach us concerning the judgment? Well, first of all and foremost, judgment is awesome and to be feared. Now we're talking about biblical fear here, that is re respect, and we're talking about the biblical use of awesome, which typically in the Bible is only applied to things concerning God. I know in our culture today we apply the word awesome to everything and have really watered down its meaning. But judgment is awesome and to be respected. We learn from passages such as Revelation 20, 12 through 14, that every man and woman will be judged. And John said, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was indeed thrown into the lake of fire. So all men will be judged. No one will escape the final judgment. The judge is revealed to be Jesus Christ himself. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and we'll read a couple of verses here, starting in 22. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And we'll stop our reading there. So the judge who will judge all men is Jesus Christ. The consequences of judgment are spelled out for us in Matthew 25, and we'll read quite a few, few verses here, so you might want to turn with me. 25, and we'll read 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of one of these, you did not do it to me. 
and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the kind of preaching Paul did before Felix. Did Paul's teaching produce the proper effects? Was the effect produced by this preaching on the mind of Felix natural and proper? Let's talk about conscience for just a few minutes. The natural marks of conscience, conscience guilt include blushing, averting the eyes, trembling, fearful, suspicious looks. All mankind possesses these natural signs of guilt, and they transcend race, nationality, culture, and locality. We feel guilt because God has provided us with a moral government that he wishes all men to obey, and we do not always live according to his precepts. The marks of conscience guilt were given to us by God and cannot be transferred to the opposite course of conduct. When these signs operate freely, they cannot be misinterpreted. Felix trembled. He was visibly afraid. It was an outward sign of his inward guilt. The signs, then, are there to put others on their guard and to restrain us from sin. Let's take a moment and compare Felix to the Philippian jailer. Remember, we read uh, concerning the Philippian jailer originally back in Acts 16, and we won't read the entire passage, but we will read uh, verses 29 through 30. Remember, this is where Paul had been thrown in prison with Silas. They were praying and singing hymns late in the night, and an earthquake came and opened the cells, and the jailer there was afraid that all of his prisoners were, would escape. But listen to this. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. So that's how the Philippian jailer responded when he was brought in contact with the gospel of Christ. How then would someone of Felix's character reject these truths? We see while the jailer yielded, Felix refused. Felix resisted his natural inclination. He violated his conscience, and in doing so, he put his everlasting welfare in jeopardy. He tried to quell his present alarm by deferring to a future time. It's what we call procrastination. Why would he and men today plead for such a delay? The interpretation of the Greek scripture shows that Felix was asking for more time to consider the matter. The time to him was not convenient. It was not suitable, and in his mind it was not appropriate. However, he did not realize that each opportunity might be his last. Why? because tomorrow, even the next moment, may never come. Some ideas for future, for further thought. It is possible for man to sear his conscience to the degree that he might not exhibit any outward signs of guilt. And I should say, is it possible, since I'm trying to ask a question here, so is it possible for man to sear his conscience to the degree that he might not exhibit any outward signs of guilt? We know the scripture teaches us that this is indeed true. It is possible. Second, how can we show men that their decision for Christ must be made now? It's of the utmost importance that it be made immediately upon understanding that you need to be in Christ. 
And finally, think of other examples of the sin now, repent later attitude in Scripture and in your own personal experience, either with your own self or with friends, relatives, and acquaintances. Thank you for watching. We certainly appreciate you attending to these videos. You could do us a big favor by subscribing to the channel, clicking on the notification bell so you'll know when the next video arrives. Also, if you would like or even dislike this video, it would help our channel. Leave me a comment below if you have anything to say about this lesson or the Apostle Paul. Until the next time, may God bless.